Hi, I'm Katie Stone. Welcome to Dystopia. This is the second in a series of videos designed to open up new pathways into the genre for those unsure where to begin, or for the hardened dystopians out there to offer an opportunity to return to first principles and try and work out what drew you to dystopianism in the first place. There will be more learning resources, reading lists and ways to get more involved on my website at katiemcgregorstone.co.uk uh, but for now, wherever you are on your journey with dystopianism and however much time and energy you have for this, you're welcome. So this is the second video where my subject will be genre. I see it as a kind of pair to the first one. Um, and as in the first one, I asked this question, what is a dystopia? Um, today, I'm taking a step back um, and trying to work out uh, why it's useful to ask that question in the first place. Um, as this is a pair to the first video, I'll also be using Lana and Lily Wachowski's 1999 dystopian film, The Matrix, as my basic exemplary text. And again, for the magical people out there who are yet to encounter the Matrix and their journeys across the internet, um, this is a film set in a future where the vast majority of humanity is imprisoned in a virtual world called the Matrix, while their bodies are farmed for energy by sentient machines. Um, the story follows Neo. Uh, who is a man awakening to the reality of the Matrix, who, encouraged by a group of friends and comrades, learns to fight against it and the machine rule, um, which has devastated this future. Um, so I'll be using this as my example when I ask the question, what is a genre? And the text that I'm going to focus on, which has informed so much of my thinking about this, is Rick Altman's book, Film Genre, also published in 1999, which I referenced in my first video. Um, Altman gives a study of previous genre criticism, so it's a good history um, for people who want to learn more. And then he elaborates his theory of genre and, and why other theories don't he thinks get to the get to the heart um, of what genre is or could mean? Um, so I'm going to start off uh, by giving you what I think is the most important point that Altman makes, kind of the core of his argument, and then I'll talk you through um, in more detail his approach, kind of how he got to this point, um, using the Matrix as my example and and applying his ideas to it. Um, before before ending on some some interesting examples that I that really stood out to me when I was reading this reading this book um, and which I hope will will appeal to you as well um, I encourage anyone uh, interested to read the book it's very it's very readable it's written in an accessible style um, but for those who don't have the time right now hopefully this will act uh, as a kind of summary um, so this is what I see as the core of Altman's argument. He says, In traditional genre criticism, the role of the critic is to stand aside and watch the effect of institutionally produced texts on unsuspecting subjects. So I'm the critic, I'm over here, I'm an objective scientist, and I look at the text, I observe their contents, um, and then I see... Uh, what genre they should be classified into. So it's very kind of impersonal um, way of understanding genre criticism. Um, but what Altman wants to argue is that genres are not inert categories shared by all, though at some moments they certainly seem to be, but discursive claims made by real speakers for particular purposes in specific situations. So... He's saying that the genre critic can't just stand there looking at these texts objectively and say, ah, definitively, this is a dystopia and this is not a dystopia. 
because, as he says, these are not inert categories. They don't just stay still. They transform over time. These are claims which are going to be different in different contexts, different times and spaces, depending on what kind of uh, communities or groups you're looking at. Um, they're going to change. Um, so he's looking at the specificity of these genre claims and saying uh, that they can't can't be assumed to be unchanging and inert over time. Another way of saying this is that the perceived nature and purpose of genres depend directly and heavily on the identity and purpose of those using and evaluating them. So Allman is interested in this on a couple of levels. He's interested in this in terms of, as I've already said, how the positions of people discussing um, genres change over time. Uh, he's interested in how that shows up in different countries or different regions across the world, um, that they will have different understandings of genre. Um, but he's also interested in it on an individual level. So, for example, I will have watched The Matrix and a couple of other dystopian films, and from those I will produce an understanding of what I understand dystopian cinema to be. However, you might have watched a completely different set of dystopian films, not overlapping with mine. And when you write your definition of a genre, your definition will be really different to mine. But what Oldman wants to say is one of us is not right and the other wrong. We are just producing different pictures of genre dependent on our individual identities and experiences, our positions, right? Um, he's interested on that individual level. He's also interested in it in terms of our position within the industries that produce these texts. So if I'm a writer or a director, if I'm involved in the production of a film, I'm a costume designer, I'm a martial arts choreographer, if I am a marketer and I'm involved in advertising a film, or if I'm just a fan and I want to decide what to go and see at the cinema that day, I will be asking very different questions about what the film is like. I'll be c collecting it with other films using very different criteria. Essentially, the genre of the film will change. It's dependent upon these factors. So I think that's Altman's key insight, moving away from this idea of a universal objective definition of genre to one that is attuned to these kind of specificities, interested in in context these films. But what I want to take you through now is to show you how that works in the context of The Matrix. So taking this concrete example and seeing how it plays out, how it affects our reading of the film. Um, and I'm going to do that by starting with a article that Altman wrote actually before this book came out in which he discussed the semantic syntactic approach to genre. So I'm going to apply this approach to the matrix so you can see how it works. And then I'm going to show you how Altman critiques himself in the book, how he supplements uh, this approach and he shows that it's, it's lacking in some ways. So, in the semantic syntactic approach to genre, what Altman wants to suggest is that some people, when they're talking about genre, are talking about semantics, and some people are talking about syntax, and that leads them to have really different understandings of the genre of a film. So what I mean by that will hopefully become clear. Semantics, in this context, people use semantics to mean very different things, but in the context that Altman is using it, semantics are the building blocks shared by texts which belong to the same genre. So we're talking about shared topics, character types, objects or key scenes. So I'll walk you through what I see as the semantics of dystopia uh, that we can find in The Matrix. We might think about the urban setting of the Matrix as part of its semantics. It's set in the city, um, and that's a really important part of many dystopian texts. Uh, we might think about the focus on work, uh, the idea that um, your time is taken up, managed and controlled within this dystopian society. You can't spend your days as you want to. You have to spend them um, generating profits for this, in this instance, very kind of faceless corporation. Uh, 
We might think about reproductive technologies, another feature of many dystopias. The idea of uh, breeding people for a purpose, um, of being able to control them from birth, is really central to dystopianism. Um, we could think about surveillance technologies as part of the semantics of dystopia. The fear of always being watched and uh, the uh, device of watching your characters through more and more screens, right? It's kind of this, we're always watching the characters on a screen, but here we're watching them on a screen on a screen, right? Um, and all of this is enforced by the police, which is another really important aspect of dystopianism, that you know that the state has this um, wing designed to enforce their program um, and that those people are armed and their use of violence is thought to be legitimate because it's on the part of the state. These are the main antagonists really uh, in the Matrix, the the agents act as a kind of FBI, I guess, um, but uh, the police are a central antagonist in the Matrix. Um, so that would be the semantics of the genre. And then the syntax in this instance would be the organization of a genre shared building blocks. So we're not thinking about these, these kind of objects. Instead, we're thinking about things like plot structure relationships between characters, these literary devices that are used. Um, so we're thinking about the organization of these building blocks. How that shows up in the matrix is we have uh, this lone, often male protagonist um, who lives an isolated life and is growing increasingly disillusioned with the world that he's living in, right? He's becoming discontent. Um, He's beginning to see it as a dystopia. He's met with a beautiful woman um, who plays a subversive role in this society. She encourages him to see the dystopia for what it is and to work against it. He's then presented with a choice. Should he continue um, living a, an ordered and obedient life? Um, a life of kind of blissful innocence, or perhaps not so blissful, um, or uh, should he choose to learn the real truth about this world um, and how it is operating? And after he chooses to learn the truth, uh, he then joy joins with a kind of resistance movement in order to, to fight um, against the dystopian regime. So this is what we would call the, the syntax of dystopianism, the, the kind of plot structure that's familiar to uh, many different dystopian texts, including uh, classic dystopias, which I'll, I'll get on to in, in later videos, but things like George Orwell's 1984, Yevgeny Zamyatin's We, texts which are written which then uh, become definitive of the genre. They follow this same model, right? So that's the semantic syntactic approach. But what Altman wants to say in his book is that that is not enough, that there's a missing piece of the puzzle when we're just thinking about semantics and syntax. And so what he develops here is what he calls the semantic syntactic pragmatic approach. So pragmatics in this instance are how genres are produced, received and discussed in practice. So we're talking about marketing, we're talking about fan forums, we're talking about reviews. We're essentially not just talking about the contents right, of the film anymore. We're talking about um, the much broader context around it. Um, so what Altman says about this is that considered by itself, it, almost any genre breakdown will appear complete and logical, like the picture that I just painted for you of the semantic and syntax of dystopia in The Matrix. Really seems like The Matrix is a dystopian film in that breakdown, right? Only when compared to the exhibition system that sustains it, does a particular generic configuration reveal its debt to exhibition institutions, okay? So 
I've taken it completely out of context when I've I've broken it down. I'm only looking at the content of it and I'm comparing it to other texts which aren't closely related to it in terms of when they were produced, in terms of the medium that they were used. I didn't mention any other films, right? Um, they're completely different kinds of texts. Now, I think that it's legitimate to make that kind of connection. I think that that is a useful connection to draw um, and an important one. Um, however, I do not think um, that that is the only way that we can define the genre of the film. Um, I think that if we look at the exhibition institutions, as Ullman encourages us to do, at the pragmatics of the genre, its context, we'll get a much more kind of rich and complicated vision um, of what this film genre actually is. Um, so, for example, and I won't be in depth with any of these because my, my topic is dystopianism, but just to quickly take you through some other ways of characterising The Matrix... Um, which are more attentive to context, we might think about The Matrix as a cyberpunk film. Um, so this is a period following the, the 80s boom in cyberpunk, uh, where writers and filmmakers were very interested in human-machine interfaces and in the then new technology of the internet. Um, uh, we were seeing a lot of cyberpunk cinema, um, so when Neo is plugged into the machine, um, we might think of something like Mamoru Oshii's uh, Ghost in the Shell, right? Um, very similar scene here just a few years earlier. This is clearly a reference point for The Matrix. Now, there's much to say about how cyberpunk is a dystopian genre. Um, these aren't unrelated pictures, but this is a really important aspect of The Matrix that I left out of my picture of it as a dystopia. Um, we might also think about The Matrix as a martial arts film. One thing that was really remarked upon at the time was the involval or involvement of Jet Li in the production of the film. And uh, that's a really crucial aspect of uh, looking at this film and how it functions in general. Um, a striking aspect of The Matrix is that it bears a real resemblance to other Hong Kong martial arts cinema, such as Gordon Chan's Fist of Legends, again, produced just a few years earlier. Um, the visual language of the film is relevant to its genre and would have been a really impactful aspect of it at the time. We might also think about the broader aesthetic of The Matrix. Um, when I described The Matrix as a dystopia, I did not mention the sunglasses, the leather coats, or Trinity's catsuit. I think things that many people think of when they think of The Matrix. Um, and yet this clearly connects it to a lot of other 90s cinema. Um, this is uh, still from Stephen Norrington's vampire classic, Blade, made in 1998, just a, just a year before The Matrix, and, and there are many other films that explore 90s leather culture, club culture, rave culture, um, in much the same way that The Matrix does. Um, all of these texts aren't necessarily cancelling out my reading of The Matrix as a dystopia, right? They're, they're just adding new layers to it and showing that it's more complicated um, than such a neat semantic syntactic breakdown um, might initially appear. And Altman actually goes further than this. He's not just interested in saying we should consider pragmatics alongside semantic and syntax. We should read these films in context and compare them to their direct contemporaries. Um, he's also interested in how the genre of a film can change over time, so the same film, even if the content of it is utterly unchanged, he argues that the way that it is discussed um, and further developments in, in his case, cinema, but we might think about all, all textual production, um, 
can have an effect on the film retrospectively. Um, so he writes that critics have always assumed that new terms should have no effect on already existing films and that generic identification is a once and for all affair. But he argues that any group of films may at any time be generically redefined by contemporary critics. And the example he uses to talk about this is um, he's talking about the film The Creature from the Black Lagoon. Um, and here he argues uh, that when The Creature from the Black Lagoon came out, it was produced as a creature feature, as part of Hammer Horror's creature feature series. However, when The Creature of the Black Lagoon came out, creature features were much less popular than they had been before. What was on the rise was science fiction cinema. Um, and so The Creature from the Black Lagoon may have been produced, conceived of, as just another creature feature, but when it came out it was marketed as part of this new wave of science fiction cinema. Okay, so the content of it doesn't change, only the marketing of it changes. Um, and then the studio goes further, right? And they say, well, if we can market the creature from the Black Lagoon as a science fiction film, maybe we can go back to all of our earlier creature features and also market them as science fiction films. Uh, so you can hear, see this poster here, which, which Altman reproduces in his book. These are Hollywood's prized science fiction creatures. And yet these creatures had never been described or connected to science fiction before at all. Now clearly there is some overlap always in the kind of concepts, the semantics and syntax of the science fiction film and the creature feature. You couldn't do the same thing with say romantic comedies. Um, there is more of a connection here. However, they're not the same and definitions of the genres would previously have, have split them off from one another. And yet, here they're being directly conflated, they're being connected to one another. Some people would want to say, well, the original definition should stand, that's the real one. Um, and all others are a kind of gimmick, they're just trying to keep up with popularity and keep up with the markets. Um, however, what Altman points out is that the original definition is just designed to keep up with popularity, to keep up with the markets. There's nothing more authentic about it. So we should be interested in how films can change their genre over time. Um, and I think this really holds true if you look at The Matrix. So after The Matrix was released in 1999, it became this real cult classic, you know, this much discussed global phenomenon, hugely successful. And... Um, as we move into, this article was published in 2016, but it describes an earlier phenomenon. Um, as we move into the, the 21st century, um, what we see is the Matrix being taken up by many different groups and read in many different ways. And one popular and very worrying uh, reading of the Matrix, which has emerged, um, was based around the Reddit forum, R the Red Pill. Um, and on R the Red Pill, uh, their focus was on the scene in the Matrix where Morpheus is holding out his hands and offering Neo a red pill and a blue pill. And obviously in the Matrix, the choice that Neo must make is whether to learn the real truth, uh, which is that the Matrix is a virtual world and uh, it's being run by sentient machines. Right? That's the truth that he will learn if he takes the red pill. But on R the Red Pill... The truth that is presented is associated with the red pill is that women are running the world, that feminism has gone too far and that men's rights have been eroded. Right. Um, so this is pretty standard misogyny, um, which is kind of dressed up in the language of civil rights and social justice. We come out of this and see the men's rights movement. Um, what is interesting about this is that even though there is a connection to the content of the film, there is this reference to a scene in the film, and we could think about um, aspects of The Matrix 
um, which feed into this reading, right? We could think about um, having this lone hero who is the chosen one um, who can save the world. Everyone else is just a potential agent of the matrix. And so they're unimportant. And um, I mean, at the most extreme example, you can kill them um, if you have to. Uh, because they're sort of not as real as you are. So we can see how The Matrix might feed into this. Um, however, uh, watching The Matrix for the first time in 1999, no one would have any idea that it could become associated um, with this particular kind um, of hateful online group, right? So reading The Matrix as a men's rights film, which you it would be possible to do, right? You could connect it to other films um, which feed into that narrative um, would have become much, much more thinkable after the formation of uh, the red pill, um, after this becomes a global phenomenon. The content of the film doesn't change, but the genre of it and its generic affiliations are shifting. And a comparable although very politically different um, phenomenon can be seen uh, in terms of uh, the reading the matrix as a piece of trans cinema um, so this is a reading of the matrix which is encouraged by the fact that after the matrix came out both Lana and Lily Wachowski is the correct the uh, creators of the matrix um, came out as trans women um, and this reading of the film, we would think about the story of the Matrix uh, being one where you are you are forced to live um, by a, a kind of artificially produced set of rules which do not fit with who you are. Um, people call you by a name that you do not want to be called by. Um, they prescribe your life and police your actions and the matrix becomes a story of breaking out of that system um, critiquing it as dystopian and moving towards a more utopian future where you can live the life that you desire many people at the time particularly trans women watching the matrix in 1999 found that resonance in the matrix and indeed the Wachowskis have said that that was meant to be there all along as Lily Wachowski is documented saying here, the Matrix is a trans metaphor. Um, however, what the Wachowskis also talk about is about their inability to make that explicit at the time and their need to kind of dampen down that aspect of the Matrix. Um, they talk about how they did not think that the world was ready for a trans film of that kind, that they personally were not ready to explicitly talk about their transness, um, and that there was specific studio inter intervention into the production of the film uh, to make it less trans. Um, so the character of Switch in The Matrix was meant to present as a man um, in the so-called real world and then as a woman in The Matrix. Um, but that aspect um, of their character was edited out, right? Um, so here we can see that there are connections between the content of the Matrix that we have access to now and this idea of uh, trans cinema. Um, however, uh, there were also really pragmatic reasons, right, why the Matrix wasn't associated with trans cinema at the time, um, why that reading of it remains implicit. Um, and hasn't hasn't emerged um, as being a dominant one until the Wachowskis come out, right? Um, so this is not to say that any one reading of these of this film was true at the time and now has become untrue or is true now and never could have been possible before. Um, we can see strands connecting all of these different generic generic um, understandings of the matrix we see i see dystopianism running through all of these possible readings um, but what i also see is that dystopianism is only one way of classifying the matrix's genre among many so when we're talking about 
what is a dystopia and how does dystopianism fit into our reading of a text, we must say that it doesn't override um, or negate any other possible readings, um, that any given text is going to have many, many possible um, generic affiliations of which dystopianism is only one. I'm going to end now uh, by leaving you with um, an idea that I really like from Altman's work um, and which I hope uh, you will enjoy as well. I think it relates to uh, what I, we, whoever you are, are trying to do here. Um, so Altman writes, Most of the time, flesh and blood genre communities remain beyond reach isolated from each other, reduced to imagining the larger group on the basis of a few faint sightings. Generic communities constitute what I call constellated communities. For, like a group of stars, their members cohere only through repeated acts of imagination. In the sky, constellations don't always have the same appearance, nor do they appear the same way to all viewers. One viewer's Big Dipper is another's Big Bear. Some of the stars that I think of as constituting a single constellation may be split by another stargazer into two or more separate constellations. Genres are commonly taken to come into being when a body of text shared a sufficient number of semantic and syntactic elements. This production-driven definition needs to be matched by a reception-driven definition recognising that genres do not exist until they serve a constellated community. With the advent of email and the World Wide Web, it will be increasingly possible for potential communities to achieve actualization. Um, so I like that uh, uh, late 90s hopefulness about the possibilities of the World Wide Web. Um, and I hope that when I point out my definition of dystopianism to you um, and connect these stars uh, that can be a way for for us to communicate in this in this fleeting and, and constellated manner and an opportunity for you to see if you can see that shape as well or make a shape of your own as i said before there'll be more learning resources reading lists um, and ways to get involved on my website at katiemcgregorstone.co.uk um, but for now thank you and you're welcome